when Rudy taught the <clears throat> introductory class, or when he would refer to the uh, exercise that we do, three concepts were expressed. Basically, I really wish to grow. I really wish to be free. And please help me to surrender. These were core concepts in the practice. They sort of share a certain common idea, which is that they are about acquisition of something, somewhat intangible, but they are about acquiring something. I want to grow. Implies that there's more to get, more to have, more to be. And that would certainly be supported by our human experience because for most of our life, <clears throat> certainly starting out very young, growth is everything. What are you going to be when you grow up? Growing pains. You watch your body transform. You watch your mental capacities evolve. You watch yourself becoming, in a sense, more and more and more. And there's a certain element of just allowing it to happen. And then there's a collaborative quality where you have to participate in the process. <coughs> <clears throat> Muscle doesn't just happen. You have to make it grow. Intelligence and understanding don't just happen. You have a process that adds to your intelligence, that allows you to grow in knowledge and insight and wisdom and in attainment and in all the things that one acquires in life. Health, wealth, well-being. We all want to grow into something greater than is currently in place. I want to be free. Free of what or to become what is a real question. What do you want freedom to be? What do you expect it to be? Why do you want it? And it probably comes down to things like freedom of choice. Freedom to have the life you want. Freedom to be yourself. Freedom to express yourself. You know, it's interesting. We have an interesting constitution in America where we're guaranteed the rights to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Liberty being freedom. People fight for it and they die for it. So it's clearly important. <clears throat> I want to be free. And then there's surrender. And Rudy always prefaced it with, please help me to surrender. And that's at the core of our breathing exercise. When you take a breath into your heart and into your navel, and you hold it for 10 seconds, the wish you express, or more particularly even perhaps the prayer you offer, 
is a asking or beseeching the universe to help you let go, surrender. And you might want to ask, surrender what? What am I surrendering? Surrendering is such a negative term in so many of our sort of cultural ideas. Surrender is to, is to lose. In a way, you surrender usually to another force that takes control, has power, over you. So a lot of people don't like that idea. Surrendering means that you end up no longer having control or in power or in charge of your own life. You, surrendering, in a way, is giving up your liberty or your freedom. So these are the three directives of this particular practice. And <clears throat> individually, they all kind of make sense. And they're hard to take into a conflicted space. They're very much like what they mean. Why should I have a problem with any of these? Let me, let me go through them, however, and try to explain my own sense of what they are. I wish to grow in the acquisitive sense, to gain power over life, to gain mastery, to gain an ability to have what I want in life, to become a mature person, to literally grow up, meaning in stature, in capacity, to have a control over my faculties, all of these things that we're programmed with. And, you know, I watch my granddaughter, you know, wanting to grow up and starting to talk about what will I be when I grow up. I watch my grandson just inarticulately, uh, uh, his whole body is about growing up. Let me walk, let me talk, let me express who I am. He wants so much to be part of the world. This is built-in programming. Growing up is so essential to the process of being a human being and being alive in the world. It's what we all want. And somehow it begins to become obstructed. Obstructed by the demands of the universe and the demands of the world that produce limitations on us. And those limitations are physical and intellectual and emotional. We all find that we start to arrive at a place where that's the easy part is over. It's pretty easy to love your parents, sort of. <laughs> And we're all kind of good at it when we're little. And then some kid comes on the playground and takes your toy away from you. And the lesson is, love your enemy. Nothing in your body wants to do that. All you want to do is hit them. All you want to do is grab your toy back. All you want to do is have what's yours. And you can't, or you, you can, there's a war zone to get it back. Because somebody came at you and took what you had because they wanted it. And right at the beginning, you're caught in this thing of, I want to grow. And grow now means what? I want to have what I want. I want to have what's mine. And somebody else doesn't want you to have it. And so growing suddenly is an effort because... Somewhere, somewhere in your religious practice, you hear this idea, love your enemy. Why can't you just talk it out? Don't hit. Ask politely. All of these things start to come in, and you discover that growing requires strange restrictions. You can't 
do the thing your instincts and desires tell you to do, you have to operate in a different way. And that's really hard for a child and, conversely, as we keep growing up, for an adult. And we find we're not really good at it. That growing somehow implies that we have to become bigger than our instincts, bigger than our desires, bigger than our hopes and fears. Growing is something that matures you into a really loving, compassionate, allowing and accepting self. And there are probably a million other ways of defining it, but what I'm trying to get at is that it ain't easy to be yourself. And that growing is ongoing. That it's a constant trying to reach for something better, kinder, purer. And that's not a given. Because for a lot of people, growing is taking, having, manifesting, showing your power, demonstrating your skills, your capacities, having more than others have, being bigger, better, owning more, all of these things. So this idea of growing becomes partly something that's liberating and something that's entrapping. If you're entrapped by your growing, something in you is going to get very uncomfortable. Very, very uncomfortable at some point in time. And this idea of I wish to be free starts to arise. Free of what? what? What do you want to be free of? Well, probably everything that is painful. Everything that is constricting. Everything that limits and ties you up in some way. <coughs> you, don't, you don't want to be free of your happiness. You don't want to be free of your kindness. You don't want to be free of the people you love. You want to be free of everything you don't like. So freedom is very, very particular and very directed for all of us and has a different meaning for each person. So I want to grow has very different meanings. I want to be free has very different meanings. We all have agendas and each one of those agendas is what we will call ego directed. The I that wants it is this person that we think we are that has needs, wishes, desires, hopes, and ambitions, that wants stuff. And so in wanting it, this idea of growing seems to serve that ego mind. The idea of freedom, too, is to serve ego mind because the ego wants to be free, meaning I don't want to have pain. I don't want struggle. I don't want difficulty. The ego mind wants to grow, to have advantage, to have what it wants. So when you ask inside for, for to, to be free, and you ask inside for to grow, you're bas basically asking for things that will encumber you and create more suffering rather than less suffering. Unless you can twist the idea around that what you really want is to grow beyond your own personal needs and to become free of you. These are very complicated ideas for most people, but the idea that you are the problem, that you are what's causing you all of your suffering, that what you truly want through growth is to grow beyond you, and what you really want to be free of is you. But nobody can quite get that. So we have this other idea at the core of this practice called, please help me to surrender. And the surrender thing we're trying to let go of is the endless, incessant you that is causing you all these problems. So, you're trying to have you, the problem causer, asking to let go of itself. 
and it doesn't really want to do that. So it creates a syndrome of subterfuge where you say, please help me to surrender, meaning give me the power to have everything I want. Give me the power by letting go to have all the happiness and all the power and all of the acquisition and all the things I truly want. The, the mind that says, I want to surrender, really is asking, in a certain sense, to get something. And as I've explained now, through many of these talks, the absolute upheaval and transformation that occurs in spiritual life, which is subtle and immediate and essential, is the realization that the wrong I is asking, that you are serving the wrong master. It's a subtle serving and you don't know you're doing it. So you sit in this class and you come to meditation or you come to somebody else's class and you work for years saying, please help me to surrender, to let go, you say, of me. But really what you mean is my discomforts, my failures, my sadness, my inabilities, all of these things. But there's still somebody who wants to own that and that's the very thing that suddenly and irrevocably goes boom. It disappears. And then there's no more you seeking anything. The you that wants any advantage is gone. The you that has been <coughs> hoping to grow and hoping to be free suddenly understands what growing is and what freedom is and surrender becomes the constant. Surrender becomes in a way what you are. There's no longer a person trying to have this. There's no longer a you seeking advantage from it. There is just this. And a huge question arises at that moment. What is this? Or what am I? Because there's no ego mind to own it. There's nobody to claim it. There's just this. And you look around yourselves, or yourself, and what are you? And suddenly there's A room and are people around you and sky and, and hills and air and you know land and water and all these primal things around you. There are energies, incredible energies of, of your own. There are emotions going on. There's th thoughts arising in this space. There's physicality in a body that's that's either growing or de decomposing. There's things manifesting all the time and there are things unmanifesting all the time and somehow you are that. You are that. Or in the parlance of many spiritual teachings, you are not that. That's one of the great dichotomies of spiritual teaching. Do you buy I am that or I am not that? Or do you understand that you're both at the same time? Suddenly, in this state, you discover that you still exist, but not as an individual separate from anybody, but as one with all that is. You are the very uprising of existence, of being. You are the formation of form and you are emerging out of something that has no form, out of the formless, out of nothing. This thing is arising. It doesn't sustain itself just by forming. It's effortful. You make effort to make this thing happen. You are required to make an effort, an effort to sustain the universe and this body form within it. 
You have to pay for it. You have to eat to have it. You have to keep, maintain some kind of health. You have to do all of this work to keep all of this afloat. And everyone has signed on for that or you wouldn't be here. And if you choose not to do that, you will decompose rather quickly. Don't eat, don't drink, don't sleep. You got a week, guys. You got four days. And you, especially don't drink. You'll be gone. So none of us want that for some reason. There's a huge hunger to keep this thing going. We seem to be born with that. This, reason, this thing about keeping it going and some profound internal fear <coughs> about not doing that. Great fear. Great hunger to be. Great fear about not being. And these are big. And these are universal. And when your ego mind goes away, it doesn't go away. There's now a kind of biological thing. Only it's bigger than you. It's about the world. It's about manifestation. Wanting to keep this alive. Keep it going. Keep it circulating. Keep it happening. Why? Because something in us is built in us or in it that wants that. And we are part of that process. And that's what we do. And then suddenly these injunctions of, I want to grow, is no longer I, Bruce, or you wanting to grow. It wants to grow. And look at what's going on out there. Every tree, every blade of grass, every person you're looking at, everything around you is growing or decomposing. But its desire is to grow. Decomposing is what ultimately happens. You become and then you cease to be. You fall back into formlessness, emptiness, nothingness. So right now we are in this incredible growth process of being and sustaining being. And it's a remarkable condition. How we got here, why we're here, I can't go there because I don't know. I can only tell you there's some mystery that this thing wants to be. To be free. What wants freedom in all of this? If there's no you to be free, what wants freedom? And that question is really interesting because what you realize when you disappear is that you are free. You are free. The thing that wants to be free ultimately lets go. And then there is freedom within the whole collective of experience and manifested form. And that freedom is really Dylan Thomas had a beautiful line, let me sing in my chains like the sea. It doesn't, freedom doesn't come by altering the density of matter. It doesn't come by changing the way things are, although you can, as an ego-minded being, try to do that. Freedom ultimately comes by saying yes to what is. Stopping the battle, fighting yourself, allowing this to be, to recognize, if you will, an extraordinary, I'm going to call it intelligence, at work. Something is going on and it will motivate you. It will also do something that's really kind of amazing. It brings you, in an emotional sense, an incredible compassion for what is. A love for and a gratitude for, and an appreciation of what is. It just arises naturally. And you will really, really care about other people. You will care about the world condition in ways you never imagined. It'll be hard to watch the news because these will no longer be abstractions. They will be real. Human suffering is your suffering. Human joy is your joy. Selflessness becomes so overwhelmingly beautiful. Blanche and I turned on the TV last night and Casablanca was on. 
<laughs> and it's one of my favorite films ever. And I was in a state of such emotional connection to that journey of this man learning to let go of the thing he loves most for the sake of the world and feeling it and feeling all these characters serving the role that they needed to serve mankind. It's so beautiful. It's so overwhelmingly depictive of what we are at our best as human beings. That's why it's celebrated as a movie because it speaks to our best humanity. And I have to say, when you truly are free, it's not freedom from, it's freedom to be. It's freedom to exist in oneness with life and you feel it like you've never felt it before. The joy and the beauty and the sadness and the grief are potent. So if you're trying to get free of all of that, it's not going to work. You only become more one with it. But, please help me to surrender. Help to surrender is a prayer. It's really important. I've never been someone who prayed, ever. <clears throat> because I never, ever felt I could pray for any advantage at all. I just never felt it worked. It didn't make sense to me. It didn't make sense to the ego mind because it's wanting something is not prayer. It's just asking for more stuff. Asking for help for other people, that's great. It's great. But it's, I never trusted it. You know, oh, please help them. You know, it's, it's kind of like saying, I'm really a good person. And I really want to be acknowledged as a good person. I'm really praying for other people. It doesn't have to be that. But it often is. But it really, at its core, is a wish for thy will to be done, whatever that will may be. And believe me, we will not know that. It's a wish to be washed free of your impurity, of your agenda, of your sense of separateness, of your thinking that there's anything to be gained by being. There's nothing to be gained. There's nothing that you need that you don't have. There's nothing at all in this universe that isn't present for you now. Everything that's looking to gain, I can tell you because I'm old enough to know that you've got to give it away at the end. Everything you want, I get it. I mean, I get the urge and the need and the ego-minded struggle to have all this stuff. And yes, go after it because it's what you do in your life. But I will tell you the secret of life is asking for help to surrender, to let go deeply and have thy will be done. And then you can have whatever life wants to give you and you can be free enough to let it all go away when the time comes to give it up because that time will come. And what I've been learning and I've expressed last week and I will continue to express as I learn these things when they say to let go, to surrender, they don't mean up to a point. They don't mean, I want to surrender everything except my deepest beliefs. I want to surrender everything but the people I love. Because that's ownership. That's still possession. That's still ego-minded. That's If you want to see where you still reside, where your ego still is locked in, that's where you go to. You find that you get to a place inside yourself that doesn't want to let go. And that's the place where growing occurs. That's the place where freedom still needs to emerge. You need to free yourself from anything that continues to be addictive or something you need to hold on to. And what shocked me in the last few weeks and what I talked about in last week's talk is that ultimately you cannot hold on to any belief or thing at all. <clears throat> and that's an idea, but it's more than an idea. It's more than an idea. It's as true an understanding as one can come to. And so when you start to have any concept 
left over, that this is the final truth. I can only tell you it's not true. <laughs> any final truth, any absolute love, I mean, if anybody loved anybody more than Humphrey Bogart loved Ingrid Bergman, I don't know. <clears throat> but he did the only thing possible for somebody who's finally discovering liberation. And he let her go. Because the lives of three people don't amount to a hill of beans in this world. Truly, that speaks to truth. And he knew it, and he let go. And that's our journey. Our journey is to grow into that awareness, to become free of everything that obstructs that knowledge, and to pray for help, to surrender, and let go of every last filament of belief in something that isn't and cannot be ultimately true. Because any concept is something you hold to, and you have to try at some point to let go of all of it. St. Teresa of Avila, her last moment of, of liberation came when she said she let go of Christ. And you can only imagine what that must mean to somebody who is a Christian mystic, whose whole purpose of being was to be one with Christ and then having to let go of that. We too have to let go of whatever ideals or sense of perfection or sense of knowing that we have because it's just another limitation. Everything, everything we think we know, we don't know. We don't know. And it's hard to walk around not knowing. And I'm finding that to be truer every day. And you know, I truly, I sat down today after I meditated with you and I said, what the hell am I going to talk about? Because I don't know anything. Because my not knowing is so profound for me. You know, but Marianne, when she came into class, we were talking, and she's talked about, you know, the first thing she learned in this practice was the wish to grow and the, and, and the wish to be free. And, I, and that came <laughs> surging up just as the class was over. And I went, well, I guess that's what I'm going to talk about. Because it came through. And so that's the genesis of this class. So even when I know nothing, and I have nothing to say, saying happens. It comes through. I, there's, no, there's no organization here. There's no desire to preach anything. It's just what arises, arises. And that's the thing I'm really learning more than anything else, that <clears throat> it, it, it arises. It happens moment to moment. And if you really get out of the way, the stuff that comes through is amazing. It's always amazing, every day. It doesn't have to be articulate. It doesn't have to be eloquent. It's just being. It's how you choose to be in the day. How you choose to be with another person. How you choose to greet the day when you walk outside. All of these things just start to occur. And they're just happening. And they will keep happening until they don't. And with some luck, perhaps, or grace, when it all stops happening, as it will, when it stops, starts decomposing dramatically, there won't be anything fighting that. The urge to surrender will be in place. Not personally anymore, but globally. To let go. To let go. Let go. And whatever ever part of you doesn't let go, and you'll see, there will be little, you know, the sticky stuff at the bottom of the pan, where, you know, after you've been cooking something, the, the stuff you've got to scrub and scrub and scrub and scrub, that's still going to be there. That's what's going on for me now. The really yucky stuff at the bottom of the pan is what I, what I face every day. Because that's what's left. And you think, okay, I'm free of everything, but that's there. So, <laughs> that's what I do. And these classes are part of that. And interestingly, you guys help me do it. Because you, in your own inimical way, is that the right word? Inimical way, help me see it. I don't know why you help me see it, but you do. I get to look at the stuff that still needs to be washed and cleaned. And, and I wash and clean. I do it between us and I do it for myself. And every day keeps bringing that up. But these meditations are so rich because they take everything else out of the equation. Everything. We sit here in a state of such 
surrender and emptiness, and then little, little tiny stuff, the glue, the sticky stuff, the, the, the stuff you don't want to look at stuff. That's what you see. And you can walk around and go, oh, I'm such an impure soul, or whatever you want to think. But that mind stuff is just bullshit. You just have to go, okay, that's old ego mind vestiges. What you see is just stuff to scrub. And then at some point, there's nothing left to scrub, I guess. I mean, as long as you're here, there might be something. I don't know. I mean, I, I'll tell you on my deathbed if I'm still talking. <laughs> but I don't, I looked at, I look at Nityananda, you know, he walked around in a diaper, you know. He slept on a slab of stone. He had what looked like terrible arthritis from the way he walked. And his, he hardly ever talked as far as I could tell. And people came in thousands to be near him because of what he had. But what did he have? Nothing. And why is that nothing so powerful? Because it's everything. It's everything. That nothing is all we're seeking, all of us. And he walked around in it, as it. He was an expression of that. And the opener, the opener, the more open and the freer and the, we become, the more we grow, that's what we will become. So, perhaps in a few years he'll come here, I'll be in my diaper, and, you know, <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I won't talk at all, and that, and, 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 and that will be more meaningful to you than anything I have to say. And I'll leave it at that. Any questions? I was just going to ask how you um, honor Rudy's death this week. Or uh, what well, in L I'll be in L.A. next week. Okay. Uh, Saturday we have, uh, <laughs> is this honoring? We have a big dinner. <laughs> we have a big samadhi dinner. And everybody comes and brings food. And uh, we have a lot of people signing up for that. And uh, even people who didn't know Rudy, because I op we opened it up to people's friends and whoever wants to come. I showed videos of Rudy that we made back in the 70s that we're so grateful that got made. And they're all available. You can go online and get them and see them. <coughs> um, and that's what we do. And we do it every year. We've done it now for 40-some I mean, years. You know, uh, And it's know what more to do and you know we're trying to you all got an e email I think we're trying to preserve Big Indian which is Rudy's um, old ashram I don't think he would have cared to be honest but we're trying to do that as a way of a kind of expression of gratitude for what he gave us and uh, that's all I do and I would tell people because you guys we won't be around you know have a dinner you know have a Hershey bar do something that makes you feel happy and good and grateful, if you can, for a teaching in your life that may be of value, you know, maybe of more value than, you know, I mean, you could probably just watch Casablanca and get the same thing, <laughs> but this is a teaching that comes at you directly that you've chosen to go to, and it has, it speaks to something that, you know, maybe uh, other people around you are not talking about. So, just to say thank you to that. Light a candle, maybe some incense, I don't know, and, and sit down and do a meditation and just say, thank you. The one thing you don't want to do is try to drag Rudy back here. Oh, Rudy, help me, help me, help me. He doesn't want to be here. <laughs> Once you're free of this place, you don't want to be back. But we're honoring the memory, the spirit, and the truth that this man had and brought us for, and you know, and never benefited from himself. I mean, the great teaching for me, for Rudy, was, you know, you just do it. You don't charge, you don't do anything, but you just... Presented, and that's a great, it's a great thing to know. And you guys can do the same thing. You can present it. You don't have to sit in a chair. You don't have to sit and meditate or give energy, in a way, not like that. You can just be this person in life who is open, surrendered, free, who's grown up, who's mature. Sure. Um, I get stuck on having an agenda to get things accomplished. And um, just wondering if you could help with that. Yeah. You know I mean, what I'm saying? Because it's sort of easy to be free when I have like no responsibility. Yeah, right, right. I mean, I mean that's around not, an uncertainty. But that's not freedom. I mean, freedom is accepting your responsibilities. 
Freedom is honoring the thing that's in front of you, the thing that arose. That's, you know, entrapment and stress is, I don't want that. I don't want to have to deal with that shit. That's, that's entrapment. Freedom is going, okay. You know, Blanche and I are going back to L.A. on Tuesday. Her car is just totaled. My car's battery won't work. We're going back with all these issues there. And I, and I can go, oh, my God, I don't want to go back to all that. Or I go back and we have to get Blanche a car and i got to get a battery for my car. And everything that's following in the week resolves itself by doing those things. And it's just, it's like you just learn to take it on. The important thing is, if you're in manifested state, and who here is not in manifested state, thing, there are rules. There are just rules. And I, you know, the simple rules, I think I said this last week, is the Ten Commandments. And then there are other rules, you know, that are just like, if you don't pay your taxes, there, there are consequences. If, if, you don't, if you don't meet the things that are arising in your life with some kind of serenity, then you will have to meet them with, with, with misery with struggle and stress and unhappiness. Your choice. You know, and as I said a few weeks ago in my class, the great thing we have through this meditation is take a breath, ask for help to surrender, and suddenly choice is clear. And the choice isn't whether to do it or not to do it, but it's to do it with simplicity and ease or with stress and annoyance. And you can choose that. You really can. The amazing thing about a breath is that it gives you an opportunity to shift gears and not to be in conflict with what is. Because being in conflict with what is, is the source of misery. And many people are in constant, endless conflict with what is from every aspect of their life. You don't want that. I mean, you can. Maybe you do. Maybe some people do want that. It gives them a purpose for being. It gives them a sense of, I'm alive. If they want it, great. You know, you have complete choice. But if you want it to be more serene and more uh, in, in attunement with life, take a breath and do it. Anybody else? Well, just to piggyback on what Shelley said, um, um, there's a, I'm in a period of my life where I've um, taken on way more than I've ever allowed myself to take on in a more conscious way. And there's some, there is some effort, and there's, and there's also struggle with it. And I think what you just spoke to is the difference of the way I'm, the way I, the choice I have to enter into. If, if you struggle, the same work will get done, but it will be done through struggle. If you don't struggle, the same work will get done without the struggle. I mean, you may have to do certain things like get up earlier, or work harder, or go to bed later, right. all of those things. But you can say, oh, God, why did I do this? Or you can go, okay, this is, what, this is how it's done. Right. You know? Right. And if you don't struggle, it tends to get done a little better, right. a little more easily. Right. And, you know, the old adage, if you want something done, give it to a busy person. That's kind of how it works, because they figured it out. You, know, you just do it. I often talk about JFK in his office, and he was attorney general, and there was a stack of paper every morning when he came in on his desk. And he said he can either look at it and go, oh my God, how does one do all that? Or he can do what he did, which is you start with the top paper, and you do it. And you work down the pile. It's just attitude. And attitude's a choice, and you can either choose to be at ease with what's happening, or to be miserable. Most people are not in a place of choice. They are programmed for a certain kind of response and they don't know there's anything they can do. So the early stages of spiritual life are beginning to see choice and taking choice. And it's an extraordinary thing. But it's just early in the game. This journey is a big journey. The journey to not being an ego mind is like, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm afraid for everyone I know who's starting out on the journey. Because I know it took me 50 years of real, concentrated, continual effort. It's not haphazard. It's not occasional. It's not, oh, I think I'll meditate today. That won't cut it. It just won't get near it. It's every day of your life, all the time. And if you do that, you might become one of the two people in a million who breaks free, who discovers what's going on. And that's an amazing thing. Who are those two people? Anyone who wants to be them. But I look at so many people who kind of, kind of want it. Or who want it for all the wrong reasons. 
and that doesn't do it. So what I'm trying to teach here is a path for the two people in a, in a, bill, in a million who can get there. That's all I'm trying to do. I'm never going to attract a lot of people, and I don't expect to, nor do I care. But I will be able to, for some people, keep reaching deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into a place that says, I am that. I am the one. Not that I ego am the one. I am the one. I am one. Anyone else? Okay, happy Rudy Samadhi next week. Saturday, light a candle, sit quietly. Thank you guys. Thank you.